Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday, I publish these videos to keep you in the loop about all things Starship development, launch events, and more. And we once again have so much to cover. From the first flight of Rocket Lab's hypersonic electron variant, Starship and Starbase updates, three Falcon 9 flights, including a landing for the history books, space station updates, Artemis news, and much, much more. Let's jump right into things. Let's begin by talking about Ship 28. Ship 20, and its eventual replacement, Ship 24, and indeed Ship 25, were all built with a sliding payload bay door, which is designed to open up when in space to allow Starlink V2s to be fired out using the PEZ dispenser mechanism. However, each of these vehicles eventually saw their doorways sealed shut, removing the ability for them to carry payloads on their test flights, or at least payload that could be deployed. And it looks like the same is now happening for Ship 28, as we saw the removal of its sliding payload bay door last week. Or is it? This animation by Chameleon Circuit, working with the amazing Ringwatchers team, created an animation of how the door was removed from the vehicle. This is different to what was seen with previous ships, which simply had a metal plate welded over the door, so it's unlikely that Ship 28 is having its payload system removed entirely as well. Perhaps SpaceX want to use an upgraded door design, or repair something that was damaged on Ship 28's door, or something else entirely. Last Monday, we saw the first initial corner section of the new Mega Bay successfully lifted and installed on the first level of the building. Later in the week, crews attempted to install the second section, but had to abort due to adverse weather conditions just moments before it was in place. Not to worry though, after allowing for the winds to calm down, another attempt was made, and there you have it, Section 2 was installed. Not long after that, we saw the third corner of Mega Bay 2 installed. This building is really coming together at pace. As for the existing Mega Bay, it has been a hive of activity. Over the course of the week, we saw the stacking process of Booster 12's liquid oxygen tank continue, reaching a nearly full height now. We also continued to see the construction of the booster's liquid methane tank within the Mega Bay, as well as Booster 12's methane downcomer, a crucial component responsible for fuel transfer and serving as a header tank during flight phases. Now, down at the launch site, we saw the first active tests in this zone following the orbital flight test two months ago. Ship 25 underwent cryogenic loading with liquid oxygen in apparent preparation for a spin prime test, but sadly, a spin prime never came and eventually the vehicle was detanked. How's that water deluge system coming along? Well, last week I covered the arrival of two new massive water tanks, and over the course of the last week, at the launch site, a gas manifold for the water deluge system was delivered and assembled. Subsequently, further progress was made in the installation of the water deluge pipework, with a sizable angle section lifted and integrated using the SpaceX LR11000 crane. Ryan Hansen has put together an amazing series of renders showing the possible final configuration of the water deluge system. I'll link the excellent Twitter thread in this video's description, but in essence, we've seen three water manifolds, a small, medium and large sized unit, which will sit underneath the launch mount in this sort of configuration, providing an upward stream of water to suppress the massive force of those 33 Raptor engines. This configuration takes into account things like underground obstacles, like existing electrical conduits, as well as a whole bunch of other things, so I'd wager that this is a very accurate prediction of how the system will end up looking. Ryan also created a render superimposed on a photograph from RGV Aerial Photography. Let's see how accurate this comes to be as we watch the deluge system assembled over the coming weeks. If you're not subscribed yet, then make sure you are so that you don't miss my weekly update videos that keep you looped in about Starbase development. And hey, if you are enjoying the flight so far, then don't forget to drop a like down below. It really helps support what I do here. Now, we had a historic Falcon 9 mission last week. On the 12th of June, SpaceX launched their 8th Falcon 9 SmallSat rideshare mission, Transporter 8, from the Vandenberg Space Launch Complex. These transporter missions deliver a large number of small payloads to sun-synchronous orbit. Several companies flew payloads aboard the rocket. In this photo, you could see them all assembled in the fairing. Man, that must be a complicated job trying to figure out how to stack them all in there like that. 
One of the Transporter 8 customers was Varda Space Industries, which deployed its W Series 1 spacecraft, built by Rocket Lab. This spacecraft aims to test the production of valuable goods like pharmaceuticals in the space environment, with plans to send them back to Earth using a return capsule. Also included in the launch was Starfish Space's prototype, the Otter Pup. This spacecraft, carried by the Orbiter SN3 Tug from Launcher, will detach from the Tug and then attempt to rendezvous with it. D-Orbit also included its latest Ion Tug on the Transport 8, without disclosing the payloads on that particular vehicle. The US military also took advantage of the Transport 8 mission, launching several satellites including four satellites for DARPA's Blackjack program, focused on testing satellite constellation technologies, and three satellites from the Space Force Space Systems Command program. Among the Space Systems Command satellites, two were imaging CubeSats named Modular Intelligence, Surveillance and Reconnaissance, while the third, XVI, aimed to evaluate Link-16 military communication in space. SpaceX's transporter missions are in high demand, thanks to their low launch costs given how many customers the cost of the flight can be spread across. According to SpaceX, they have full bookings for transporter missions until the second quarter of 2025. But wait, I started this whole bit by calling this a historic Falcon 9 mission. Why is this? Well, this launch marked a milestone for SpaceX, as the first stage, on its ninth flight, successfully landed back at the Vandenberg launch site, marking the 200th landing of a Falcon booster to date. It's crazy to think that something that was once seen as impossible has been made so routine by SpaceX, and that these landings still hit just as hard as they did the first time SpaceX pulled one off, all the way back in 2015. Transporter 8 wasn't the only Falcon 9 mission last week. We also saw Starlink Group 5-11 launch on the same day as Transporter 8, from the Kennedy Space Center as opposed to the Vandenberg launch site. This was a pretty standard affair mission. The rocket carried 52 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit, and following stage separation, Falcon 9's first stage landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. This first stage was Booster 1073, which had previously supported eight missions. Hippasat Amazonas Nexus, SES-22, Hakuto RM-1, CRS-27, and four Starlink missions. The third and final Falcon mission from last week was on Sunday, and this time the rocket carried the single PSNM Satria-1 satellite to a geosynchronous transfer orbit from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Following stage separation, Falcon 9's first stage landed on the A Shortfall of Gravitas drone ship, stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. Satria-1, whose name stands for Satellite of the Republic of Indonesia, will be operated by the Indonesian company PSN on behalf of the Indonesian government. It's designed to boost connectivity inclusion in the country, providing free internet connection to 150,000 public facilities. I think one of the most interesting launches we saw last week was the Rocket Lab Haste mission. This was an electron launch with a twist. This is not an electron, technically. <laughs> this is an electron derivative vehicle named Haste, which stands for Hypersonic Accelerator Suborbital Test Electron. Another interesting thing about this launch was that it was super secret. There was no official live stream or webcast of the launch. The only video that we have of it was captured by Kyle Henry. Check out his Twitter and his website, both linked in the description. The secret nature of this mission is because it is believed to have been a test platform for military hardware, which is obviously something you don't want potential enemies learning about. Hypersonic test platforms like Haste can be extremely valuable, as they allow you to develop technology that works at hypersonic speeds without needing to develop something to get it to those speeds in the first place. Example payloads for Haste might include things like materials research, guidance technology and ensuring it works in interfering plasma, and possibly even hypersonic control surfaces or hypersonic engines. NASA successfully completed its second to last hot fire on the 15th of June as part of a key series of tests to certify the production of its upgraded RS-25 engines for the SLS rocket. These engines will play a crucial role in powering future Artemis missions to the moon as NASA continues its efforts to explore the secrets of the universe for the benefit of all. <laughs> Over 800 employees and family members from NASA gathered at the Fred Hayes test stand located in NASA's Stennis Space Center near Bay St. Louis, Mississippi to witness the event, which marked the 11th out of a total of 12 tests in the series. The final test, scheduled for the 22nd of June, will set the stage for Aerojet Rocketdyne, the lead contractor for the SLS engines, to manufacture new RS-25 engines for future deep space missions beginning with Artemis V. 
During last week's test, the operators powered the RS-25 engine for over 8 minutes, which aligns with the amount of time needed to launch the SLS rocket and send astronauts aboard the Orion spacecraft into orbit. The engine was also tested up to 113% power, surpassing the required 111% power for launch to provide an additional margin of operational safety. The crew aboard the International Space Station has had a bustling month of spacewalks dedicated to the continuous improvement and updates of the orbiting laboratory. A couple of weeks ago, NASA astronauts Steve Bowen and Woody Hoberg, who are part of Expedition 69, successfully completed their initial spacewalk, spending a remarkable 6 hours and 3 minutes outside the space station. Their mission involved the installation of an ISS rollout solar array on the station's starboard truss structure to enhance power generation for the 1A power channel. Following this, last week Bowen and Hoberg embarked on another spacewalk, this time to install the sixth rollout array. They focused on the starboard 6 truss, facilitating power channel 1B. This spacewalk also marked the impressive milestone of the 265th spacewalk in support of space station assembly, upgrades and maintenance. Bowen, a seasoned astronaut, now has 10 spacewalks under his belt, while Hoberg has completed his second. Looking ahead, the next spacewalk is scheduled for Thursday the 22nd of June, featuring Roscosmos cosmonauts. They will undertake the tasks of removing experiment hardware and installing new data transmission equipment. The estimated duration of this spacewalk is approximately 7 hours. The International Space Station serves as an invaluable global observation and diagnosis station, enabling international efforts to study and address environmental issues on Earth. Its strategic position allows astronauts to closely observe Earth's ecosystems, utilizing both hands-on and automated tools. Recent weeks have witnessed the space station crew capturing photographs of the raging wildfires across Canada. Striking images, such as those taken near Shelburne, Nova Scotia, on the 29th of May, vividly portray the extent of the devastation caused by these fires. Within a matter of days, the inferno had consumed an area of over 75 square miles, earning the title of Nova Scotia's largest forest fire in history. The resulting smoke has severely impacted air quality in the northeastern United States. I thought I'd take the time to include some KSP2 updates in these videos. Do you want this in future Space This Weeks? Let me know in the comments down below. But first, the release date for the next update has been pushed back by two days, shifting from Tuesday to Thursday the 22nd of June. This delay is necessary due to a couple of critical bugs that the devs believe would have a significant impact on the quality of the update. While the update will include a substantial list of fixed items, there are still some major bugs that will persist. For instance, the orbital decay issue, which remains a top priority for the developers, hasn't been completely resolved. The latest dev diary also talked about wobbly rockets. The devs wholeheartedly agree with the community's concerns regarding this issue, ranking it at number 10 on their top 10 issues list. They have implemented several measures to address different aspects of the problem. Their ultimate goal for de-wobbling rockets is as follows. Serial connected inline parts will have minimal to no flexing. Some flexibility is expected in radially attached boosters and in certain cases manually applied struts may be required. Wings will remain rigid and not require struts. Docking two vessels in orbit should result in a strong and stable connection that doesn't collapse, and the devs also aim to move away from relying on auto strut or other temporary solutions that involve hidden settings in order to artificially enhance vehicle rigidity. However, if during early access it becomes evident that some form of auto strut is still necessary, they will re-evaluate this requirement. There is actually quite a lot to unpack regarding the whole wobbly rocket situation that might warrant its own video, so stay tuned to my channel for this if I end up making it. The latest dev update ended with some new animations for Kerbals during sample collection, which will be part of the science update. There's unfortunately still no concrete timeline for when this update will happen though. If you enjoyed today's episode of Space This Week and want to help support this channel to help make all of this content possible, then consider signing up to my Patreon and channel membership programs just like these wonderful people did. I have to pay royalties for a lot of the footage and photos that I use, so your support is always appreciated. If you want to see more from my channel, there should now be two videos on the screen. Don't know what they are, I think one is like my latest upload and one is just a video from my channel that YouTube thinks you'll like. Hopefully it's a good choice. If not, still check it out anyway because, you know, you only live once, might be a pleasant surprise. There's a subscribe button I think as well. And uh, that's it, I've run out of time. Thanks for watching.